Okay, good morning everyone. Um, to those who joined a little bit later, um, our topic today is for paper two, which means it's everything on settlements and then also economic geography. Now, as you all know, in economic geography, we have been provided with prescribed content. So that means that they have to ask you um, at least one of them, but they normally ask about three of the four. So let's have a look. I'm going to start with the settlements, uh, which in my opinion is one of the easiest topics. Although in my experience, learners do struggle because they also view it as being easy and then they sometimes misinterpret uh, some of the questions. Right, the study of settlements. Now, grade 12's first thing that you need to know here is the different topics on rural and urban settlement. Remember, we in Cape Town and the learners in, in, um, in Cape Town, we live in an urban settlement. Learners a little bit further away, and I know I also grew up in a rural settlement, a very hot one um, of Oatsorn. They all have different issues. They have different functions, and they also appear different in our map work. And then also um, with urban hierarchies, different cities, a, a, a mega city like Los Angeles, they all have different features, different characteristics. And let's be honest, they can be how big, they are not as beautiful as our city of Cape Town. I'll proceed swiftly with a study of settlements. Oops. There we go. Right, so the first settlement that we are doing is the rural settlement. Now, on this topic, we will look at the study of the rural settlement and then also issues that these settlements face. Firstly, very important, um, grade 12s, you need to know the different questions that geographers ask. Now, when you start studying, uh, various questions will help you determine how can those examiners try and trick us when they ask the questions. So one of the first questions is, what is it? So that will be your definition, your concept, which will always be two marks. Now, lately, and also in the common papers, uh, your definitions have been slightly altered and they might be lenient and give you one of the two marks if you give half an answer. But why do you only want 50% if it's easy to get 100% for your settlements? So on that photo, you can see the city of Cape Town with a stadium, the CBD, the mountain in the background, as well as our bustling Cape Town Harbour. Firstly, let's have a look. In Cape Town or in an area where, where people live, they are grouped together. They live in buildings, they work in office buildings, they attend schools, they've got communication networks, they do have electricity, and then also various activities. So just by looking at this photo, you can see that there's a lot of people residing in this area. They've got activities. You can see there's a boat in the harbor, quite a few boats actually. You can see the stadium. And then also this is a pretty old photo of the stadium, but then you can also see the recreational activities in and around Cape Town. Very important, with a settlement, they function on a daily basis. Now, the photo depicts an urban settlement, but let's have a look at this photo that appeared lastly. That would be a rural settlement. Okay, there's no high-rising building. Um, there's absolutely uh, no stadium or waterfront or shopping mall. So that is definitely rural. Let's quickly have a look at how these settlements are classified according to size. 
we start with the smallest one, which is your isolated farmstead. Now, if you are isolated, remember in COVID when you were sick, you had to stay away from people. So if you are isolated, it means you are very small and you are far from other cities. We then proceed into size with a hamlet, a village, a town, a city such as the one that we are living in. We then move over to a metropolis, a conurbation, and then the massive city, the biggest one of them all, your megalopolis. So like the animation in indicates, we start from small and then we go on to the largest one. Now, learners, this question has been asked a lot of the time and they ask you to group or to arrange uh, certain um, settlements according to their size. They normally ask it either list them according to size or they give you a little triangle where megalopolis might be at the top um, or at the bottom. But the shape of the triangle will indicate the hierarchy and the size. <clears throat> the three that are classified as rural would be our isolated farmsteads, our hamlets, and then our villages. When we move on to the urban areas, they are a lot less um, rural. They've got more functions. They've got more activities. They also have more people. So with an increase in size, you also have an increase in the amount of population, the amount of people that reside in these settlements. Our different types of settlements, just in the corner, I need to focus your attention to the definition of a settlement. It's a group of people living on a day-to-day -day basis in an area that has buildings, communication networks, as well as functions. So with the rural settlements, there we go. A rural settlement is unifunctional. So they are unique. Um, they have different functions and different activities, mostly primary activities because I always refer to farms as rural. Um, so let's have a look. We have farming fishing, mining, and then also forestry. When we move over to the urban areas, now we have multifunctional um, settlements. So now we look at tertiary, um, secondary, quaternary activities. That means that they are moving more into the industrialized. They've got more hospitals. They've got more people live, uh, working in um, IT, for example, or banking. And there's a lot of service provision. If we move on to the size and the complexity of rural settlements, you have the isolated farmstead, a single farmhouse, and the outbuildings. So very important if you look at your map work, Try and figure out, do I have a farmstead? Do I have a farmhouse? And do, can I find different outbuildings, Okay, such as a silo on the premises, for example? Rural hamlet, a loose grouping of farmsteads. So mostly in a rural area, you will have a small grouping of little black squares, which will indicate our farmsteads. Then a village would be a dense grouping. You might even have certain functions such as um, a clinic in your village. If we proceed to urban areas, immediately now you have a town, a city, a metropolis, a main city surrounded by towns. You have a conurbation, which is a massive group of cities joined together. And then you have a megalopolis when you have a group of conurbations that have been joined together. Very important, each of these settlements, whether they are rural or urban, will have a very distinct pattern. <clears throat> Our rural areas will be dispersed. In other words, 
the buildings are far apart. If you think about farms, they don't have a neighbor next door that they can go and ask for some milk or sugar. They need to drive, in most cases, more than 50, sometimes 140 kilometers. If you go into a very remote and rural area such as the Northern Cape, then some farms are about 200 and more uh, kilometers um, from each other. They are also far from a nearest town. Then when we get to our nucleated or compact pattern, the buildings are closed or close together. You can also use the word the buildings are clustered together. Our fourth aspect is the shape of these settlements. So there we have round, mostly around a central feature, linear, mostly following a road, the coastline, or the topography. And another word for topography is our relief, which in short is our mountains. And then crossroads. So crossroads can be where there's a river and the, there's a bridge that crosses the river. Crossroads can be where um, roads intersect. Crossroads can be where railroads intersect. So we're going to have a look at those shapes a little bit later. Then site and situation. Now, when we started with the different um, settlements in, in, in school, I'm sure your teachers discussed site and situation. So the site is the physical place of the settlement. And then the situation is the area around that settlement. Right, so let's have a look. Very important. What is a settlement? So what is a rural settlement? What does it look like? Okay, why is the rural settlement there? Or why is the urban settlement there? And then also what problems do they have? What's the impact of those problems. So have a look at um, the questions that geographers ask. Very important, the function refers to the economic activity that is practiced within that settlement. So for example, the function of a rural settlement, if it's a fishing settlement or if it's a farming settlement, that would be the function. <laughs> Very important, you need to be able to distinguish between settlement types. So if you distinguish, you have to highlight and identify the differences between those settlements. Let's have a look. <clears throat> right, so there are some lovely animations. There's a tractor with a plow in the rural settlement. And then the urban settlement, you can clearly see in that animation as it runs through, you have tall buildings. You don't have a lot of greenery. You don't have a lot of trees. You've got a lot of squared blocks. So there would be a lot of uh, traffic congestion and then also a lot of people. Buildings are close to each other. So that would be a high density area. What are the functions? Let's have a look at the rural settlements. So they have one function. It's mostly primary economic activities. And then very important, an example would be agriculture or then are farming, mining, fishing and forestry. In our urban settlements, remember, they've got many functions, multifunctional mostly secondary and tertiary economic activities. Don't forget about the quaternary and even quinary sectors. So the secondary sectors, those are your industries, tertiary, your health services. Look at that poor soul going to the dentist and then also tertiary financial services. So there's definitely a service being provided in the tertiary sector. Let's have a look at our settlement patterns. Now, the pattern refers to the spacing or the distribution of buildings in a settlement. You have to be able to not just in your theory, 
but also in your map work. Identify the settlement pattern as well as give reasons. And then also describe what factors could have caused the certain type or, or the pattern of that settlement. As soon as you have a nucleated or clustered settlement or dispersed and isolated, what does it look like on a map? So nucleated or clustered, think about a, the nucleus. So very important, the buildings will be close together. If it's dispersed or isolated, have a look at the key there, the yellow squares, those are your buildings. With dispersed or isolated, can you see that there's a large distance in between those yellow squares, in other words, the buildings, in comparison to our nucleated or clustered um, settlement pattern. There, you don't have a lot of space in between the buildings that are very close together. Very important, what is it? So I want you guys to have a close look at what can I see on the photo or on the sketch. They've provided us with the key. That's our buildings. So what can we interpret from that sketch? The buildings are close together. You might have a hospital or a police station there. So they are all urban settlements. And then very important, if they are nucleated, they are close, they are urban. Then only two of the rural settlements can be classified as nucleated or clustered. And that is your hamlet and your village. When we proceed to dispersed or isolated, again, I always tell my learners in geography, the answers are right in front of you. You just need to know how to interpret all those diagrams and what are they actually trying to show me. So with a dispersed or isolated diagram, you can see that the buildings are far apart. There are no settle, uh, urban settlements and that can only be an isolated farmstead. Very important. Why disperse settlements better from an economic point of view? Now, very important. With a nucleated and a dispersed settlement, every single settlement, they've got their advantages and their disadvantages. So let's quickly have a look. If your buildings are close together, even in map work and just like on these photos, you can see various loose patches of land. So there you will have one individual, the foreman, that manages the, uh, the settlement. Very important, those farmers, they cannot make independent decisions. If they want to plant a certain crop, they need to go and first get permission if they can do it. A lot of them live in the village, which means they have to travel. And what also it makes things difficult is the fact that they can't recognize um, easily. They and because they can't make independent decisions, it first has to go through the foreman or sometimes also um, the leader almost. Um, so they can't really improve uh, with regards to technology because of um, a whole system and, and certain steps that they have to go through in order to, to make a decision. When we moved on to dispersed, there are buildings are widely separated. It's a large single farm and mostly you will have the farm name um, close to the close to the, the farmstead itself or then also in your map work you would have a single farmstead with various roads leading to different um, areas of cultivated land. <coughs> the farmer then manages his farm himself. He can decide on this uh, area I'm only going to plant sunflowers. On this area, I'm not going to even plant anything this season. So he can make independent decisions. 
There's not a lot of traveling needed. Everything is there with him. And then he can easily make it nice because of being able to make those decisions independently. Right, very, very, very important, Great Twelves. This is a question from Mapwork. So they ask you to name the settlement pattern at 10. Now we can clearly see that this is an extract from an ortho photo, and then the 10 points to the settlement of Moria, Sondela, and then another settlement. Remember on our ortho photo, our scale is 1 to 10,000. So you can also now have a look and measure the distance between those farmsteads in order to uh, determine are they dispersed or are they nucleated? What's the distance between them? It's a very quick um, distance equation that you just have to do. So there we have dispersed uh, settlement pattern. Those buildings are widely separated. And then they ask you to state two economic advantages of the settlement pattern. Now, it's not just advantages. I want you to have a look that they ask for economic advantages. In other words, the, the pros almost of money with regards to the settlement pattern. <laughs> it's a large single farm. In other words, he does not have to share any profits. He manages the farm himself. He can then also uh, decide where the profits are going and where more investing needs to happen. He lives on the farm, so he saves money. There's no traveling, and then he can easily invest in mechanization in order to boost the uh, efficiency and then also the productivity of the farm. So grade 12s, this is an example of how they can ask um, the settlement patterns by means of map work. Then when we move over to site, remember the site is what would make us choose that settlement. Now I always say not even if they pay me a million bucks. I'm not going to go and live in the Sahara Desert. It's just sand. It's no water. It's super hot. So why would I go and live there? Let's have a look at this photo or this image, for example. If I want to live there, the factors that influence sight is the factors that literally we cannot live without. Water, we can't live without. Fertile soil, if we don't have fertile soil, we can't grow crops for food. Fuel, for example, if we don't have fuel, in other words, woodland or building material, then I can't construct a settlement or a house for myself. Building material from the woodlands. And then very important, especially in South Africa, our settlements always face north. Um, so very important, especially even in your paper one, to have a look at where those settlements are and where's north on the map and are we on the north facing slope or the south facing slope. Carrying on onto the sketch, we have water from the river, we have fertile soil to the left, we then also have a hilltop. In other words, we can climb onto the hilltop, uh, especially in the olden days. It will make it a good defensive site because they can see far and they can see if there are dangers approaching. Then also they indicate a dry site above marshy land. So that would be a dry point settlement then. And then also good grass for cattle farming. Now, very important, light should be flashing now, cattle farming, bee farming, it's one of our prescribed topics. Then that settlement is nucleated because it's at the crossroad, it's the meeting place of roads. 
let's have a look at the following. Again, look at that question, what is it? So you need to be able to give a definition for those. Right, the site is the exact piece of land occupied by a settlement, whereas the situation is the position of a settlement in relation to the wider surroundings. In other words, other settlements or then rivers. Why is it there? So the site, we've got water supply, fertile land and grazing. We've got forests, we've got minerals, or there might be a natural harbor close by, which means we can trade. With situation, is it above the flood line? Is it on the north facing slope in the southern hemisphere? And then if you look at your valley climate in uh, paper one, is there a warmer thermal belt or is it on the mid slope? And then also, is it close to transport roads and how accessible is our settlement? Right, so then also you have a dry point, a wet point, and then a defensive type of site. <clears throat> so a dry point is a site in a wet area where the settlement is placed above the flood line to avoid the risk of flooding. A wet point would be a site in a dry area where that settlement is placed close to the only source of water. For example, close to a wind pump, close to an oasis. And then with defense, a site on high grounds where safety is a priority that allows the inhabitant to see enemies from a distance. How will you see this on a map? Remember, defense, your contour lines will be close together, indicating a steep slope in, or, in order to get the higher ground. A wet point, you will see the settlement very close to a river, and those rivers will mostly be um, non-perennial because it's in a dry area. It might be a very thin perennial river. Our dry point you will have a lot of perennial rivers. You will see that those rivers are wider, they are larger, and the settlements would be further away in order to not risk um, being flooded. Right, what factors influence sites? So fertile soil, um, whether they are dry, do they have fuel, do they have building material, um, are they... Uh, safe, in other words, the defensive uh, act, uh, aspect, and then also do they have um, grazing and then also um, areas that are level in order for them to build? Do, are they accessible? So there you have to look at the roads. Right, this is just a quick slide to show you the round, the crossroad, and the linear. So linear can be along the road or the river um, where, where roads cross, the cross road. Again, the answer always in front of you, cross road. Um, and then uh, the round shape would be around a central point, historically around a marketplace or a church or even um, a castle in, in the older days. Right, so let's quickly have a look at the following. So this has been asked quite a few times and there's one tricky question that I just quickly want to point out, seeing that we are doing settlements. Very important, we've got to look at what do we have on the sketch. We can see that there's a north arrow pointing upwards. Immediately, I want you to have a look at the following. Our 720 points uphill, and then all of a sudden, this 740 appears upside down. In other words, there you have a hill. And then you have settlement C on the other side of the hill. You've got a key that shows you the water source. All the dots are the farmsteads, you have the road, <clears throat> and then you have the farm boundary. So now they ask us, what is the pattern of the settlements at D? 
and A. So our farmstead at D is close together, not a large distance in between. So that is definitely A, nucleated settlement. And then A, you can see there's a farmstead, there's a farmstead. And those farmsteads have quite a larger distance between them. So they are dispersed. What is the shape? And then they ask you to explain the factor. So the shape of the settlements at B and D. So D is a circle, which is round. B, it follows the road as well as the river. So B has to be linear. The factor that influenced the shape, and again, the answers are right in front of you. They tell you that the rectangular block there is the water source and D settlement is located around the water source. And then also with B, it's along the river and it also follows the road. Now, grade 12's question four, state and explain the climatic factor responsible for the location of settlement C. Remember, always look at what are they giving me. There's a north arrow. Shows you that north is at the top of the map, just like any map that you'll get. You have your contour lines indicating an increase in height and then also decreasing height, which means that this is a hill and settlement C is on the north facing slope. Now, remember when we're working with slopes, the factor would then be aspect. Okay, please remember that. Right, so now we have to cross out the incorrect options. Right, is the settlement of Malkblas rural or urban? Um, I think, ma'am, let's have a look if the learners can um, join on the WhatsApp group. Let's make it interactive. So the settlement of Malkblas, would that be rural or urban? And then also the settlement over here. Would that be rural or urban? Okay, learners, you are welcome. Okay, so there's rural. Right, there's no name, rural, rural or urban. Okay, so we're looking at those ones. Um, Matthew. Right, so Matthew and another student says it's rural. So let's see. Um, then let's have a look. It's rural and my name's Bronwyn. Thank you, Bronwyn. All uh, right, so both Bronwyn and Matthew says it's rural. Now let's have a look. Would those settlements be nucleated, dispersed, or isolated? And then also, is it a linear or a crossroad? And then also, I want us to just have a quick look at the settlement over here. So let's see. Right, so it's definitely not urban. So the settlement on the left. Is it linear? Okay, looks like Bronwyn says linear. We'll have a look just now, Bronwyn. Right, so I'm focusing on this area over here. <laughs> I 
Right, let's have a look. So the settlement over here is definitely not nucleated. It is also not isolated because they do have other farmsteads surrounding them. So it is dispersed. And then let's have a look. Um, Bronwyn on the WhatsApp chat said it's linear. Let's have a look if she's correct. There we go. Well done. So now let's move on to Malplas. It's definitely not urban. And then is Malplas nucleated, dispersed, or isolated? So what you can also do now to help you, grade 12s, is to have a look at what we have on the left. Okay, so let's have a look. Malplas is rural and it is not nucleated because it's just the one uh, farmstead. Therefore, it can't be dispersed like this settlement and then it has to be isolated. Then let's have a look at this one over here. Is it rural or urban? It's surrounded by agricultural land. I don't see any major built up areas. Therefore, it has to be rural. And then will it be nucleated, dispersed or isolated? What can I see? I see a group of farmsteads and immediately there's my answer. It can't be dispersed. It has to be isolated. Um, it can't be isolated. Sorry. It has to be nucleated. All right. So grade 12, this is just an example to, to indicate to you how they will be able to ask the theory of settlements on map work. Right, very important, land use in rural settlements. So let's have a look there. So at A and at B. At A, there you can see its orchards and vineyards, and B would be your forest or your woodland. At C, and then um, very important, your protected area. Right, let's have a look over here. At D, you have agricultural land, in other words, cultivated land. E, you have orchard and vineyard. And again, grade twelves, the answers are at the bottom of <laughs> um, apologies, the bottom of the map in your reference. There you have your protected area. And normally, when you see um, the words typed in capitals and in green, it's mostly a nature reserve. When you have these straight lines that they've shaded green, that's your protected area. Right, let's have a look at the following. So I'm not going to keep you too long, but let's just have a look. The learners are welcome to give me the answers of question 1.1.1 to 1.1.3. So refer to the figure below. Let's have a look. They provide us with the key indicate, indicating road and houses. So the pattern of settlement A, the shape of B, and the shape of settlement C. If the learners can just quickly give me their answers on the WhatsApp group, please. <coughs> Rizan, Matthew says it's B. 1.1 is B. All right, so the of A, let's have a look. We've got our houses. They are far apart. Our option is isolated, dispersed, nucleated, or village. I think I agree with Matthew. Um on dispersed. Is there anyone that differs from Matthew? 
Yes, there's a petal that says it's a D. Oh, sorry, it's 1.1.3. Oh, wow, they've already gone to 1.1.3. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so they are definitely awake on this uh, Friday morning. Let's see. Um, the shape of settlement B. So now let's have a look. What are they giving us? They're giving us a road and another road and it crosses. So the answer is always in front of you. B, a crossroad. So I agree with the learners that said it is B. Right, then 1.1.3, they ask us the shape of settlement at, or the shape of the settlement at sea, apologies, was determined by the what? So now let's have a look. There's our settlement C and all our houses are located next to the what? So there's no indication of a CBD on the sketch. Um, they are close together, so it's definitely not the need for privacy. There's no river indicated on the sketch, so C is completely wrong. And then the last option that remains is D. So, Grade Twelves, can you see that on the sketch, a lot of the time learners just look at it and then they start answering their questions. Look at what the examiners give you. And nine out of 10 times, the answers will always be in front of you. All right. So I know learners are mostly on their cell phones and screen time. And then they sometimes, I know their attention span is just as short as a TikTok video. But in your exam, you've got three hours, 150 marks. 60 marks for question one, 60 marks for question two in paper one and paper two, and then map work of 30 marks. So grade 12s, your question paper is not a TikTok video. It's not an Instagram reel. So it's not a YouTube short. And I need you to spend your time and look at the pictures that we give you, the photos, the diagrams. And I've proven my point here. Because the answers will always be there. You just need to know where to look for them. All right, let's carry on. Question 1.1.4. Now, immediately, now you have a hierarchy of settlements. They show you that there's a decreasing number of services, the number of settlements, and then also the increase in the population. Refer to the hierarchy of settlements below to answer the following question. The settlement at D on the hierarchy, um, or is what on the hierarchy due to the number of services? Now, very, very, very important. A lot of the questions now in multiple choice. They've got these options. So they give you the Roman um, numbers where one, two, three, and four. Now you have to choose two of them and only then give your choice of the correct letter. Now, I forgot to say this on the previous slide, grade 12s. If the question, let's just quickly go back, they ask you um, to write only the letter next to the question numbers. Now, there will come a day where at the marking center, they will tell us that we cannot accept the word. And I agree with them because did you answer the question if you write, let's say our answer at one was B dispersed, they asked us to write only the letter. So that's the question. We had to choose the letter B. They did not ask us to write the word. So up to now, they have accepted the word. But I always say, is your answer of dispersed really correct if you've written the word and not the letter? And I know at paper two where we mark, there's a whole ritual. Did the learner answer the question? 
yes or no. And can I link it to the marking guideline? So that's very important. Our chief marker and our internal moderator, the senior markers, the markers we all know. Let the learner answer the question, yes or no. So grade 12, if you've now written the word, did you answer the question? Mm -hmm, not really, but we can link it. So I want to stress the fact that you need to read the questions and then especially write down the letter because that's what they have asked. Moving on to question 1.1.4. Um, the, the quiz is in the group as well because it also focuses on these questions so the learners can also go through the quiz. Oh, okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, ma'am. Okay, so with the quiz, uh, Ms. Prinsler mentioned that you guys can do the quiz and then she'll be able to see um, the learners who did the quiz and then also the learners that did very well in the quiz. Um, and then she mentioned something about prizes um, because afterwards she'll be able to log into the, the quiz. Right, so then let's have a look at the, the uh, numbers. So now the settlement at D in the image is what on the hierarchy due to what in the number of services. So then if we have a look at D, there's D, it's isolated, it's far apart, or it's far from others. So then it is lower on the hierarchy due to a decrease in the services. So which one of our options, A, B, C, or, <coughs> sorry, or D, has got the number two and the number four. So there we're not going to write two and four, we're going to write the option of C. Right, so these are questions where a lot of learners and a lot of candidates at the end of the year, where they then struggle um, and they lose unnecessary marks because it's a two-part answer. Okay. Let's move on to rural settlement issues. Right, now I love the, this um, slide. So again, with geography, the answers are right in front of you. Rural, urban, migration. Now by now we all know that migration means the movement of people. So you migrate. Animals migrate, the birds, the whales um, along the west coast also. So they migrate and then people also move. Where do they move? They move from the rural areas to the urban areas. And there you have the answer as to what is rural urban migration. Let's have a look. Push factors. Now I've got a young gentleman in my class um, and he described it so beautifully. He said, if you have a good looking goal, it's better than the one that you had. So it sh the, the new goal pulls him towards her and the other one pushes him away because she does not want him anymore so it was it was so nice to see how they have their own spin on push and pull factors so if i'm a worker on a farm and the the, the farmer now invests in mechanization he will now have machines that can do my job a lot quicker and more efficient and in a shorter time frame and get the product to the market and get his money quicker than if I'm doing it. So because the farmer has got mechanization or machinery, he does not really need my services. I won't be able to get a large um, crop from the 
field. So my, my salary and my, my uh, weekly wage will be lower. Uh, about, sure, is it six, seven years ago, the Western Cape experienced a massive drought. And a lot of farmers had to let people go because they had to get rid of their livestock. Um, they, they didn't have crops out on the field in order to harvest them. So people had to move away from the farms. Crime, uh, farm murders, um, theft of, of livestock, all forced people away from the settlement. So it's a negative. And then also due to mechanization, the farmer needs to, to lay staff off and that will lead to unemployment. Another one that's also not there on the slide is if I'm living in a rural area and I've got a shop. If people move, I won't have feed coming in through my shop that will buy my products, such as milk or bread, in order to get money. So the milk and the bread and the produce that I have in my shop will ultimately then go off or um, stay on the shelves past the expiry date. And then my shop will then um, not make a profit. Um, and we will, we will work at a loss which will also force me to close my shop and the, the person or the people that might have baked bread in the shop or in the bakery, they will have to be laid off. Then why are they moving away from the rural areas into the urban areas? They've got a, a prospect of a better job, a higher salary. They've got a choice of education. They've got medical facilities. And then the concept of the bright lights. Now, I always explain it in, um, in my class, whenever there's a fire or even an accident on the N1, you always have the police cars, you have the fire brigade, and you have the ambulances. And it's almost like people are attracted and drawn to that accident scene because of the flashing lights. They, they are curious. They want to see what happens. And the bright lights factor is people want to see um, what's going on in the cities. They are being attracted. They are being pulled into the city. Right, <clears throat> let's have a look at the impact on the rural areas. Very important. As people move away, you will have empty farmhouses. You will now have crime, unemployment. Who would like to invest in an area if there's a drought? Okay, so you won't have new investments. A lot of the older people will remain there because that's the only place they know. They've grown up there and they are quite content living in the rural areas. So older people, aging population, they won't necessarily be able to work hard on the farms. A lot of the young people go, and then also you have the decline in agricultural land, because a lot of young people with the skills, they will now move to the cities and the old people might not know how to drive a tractor or when to irrigate um, and how long and how much. As I've mentioned before, your shops will close and then also schools will be empty. So children of people choosing to remain in the rural areas, they will now have to go into the cities in order to get an education, which then becomes an additional burden on their families because now they have to pay a taxi fare and then also um, pay for school um, at a hostel or lodging in order to get their, their, child their children into a school in the cities. Let's have a look at the impact of the 
urban areas. Remember, the urban area, already a lot more people than the rural area. So now what happens is people move into the urban area because of these prospects of better jobs and salaries and education and so on. However, if they move into the, the urban areas, they might tend to crime because they cannot find a job. They are often not qualified to do certain jobs in the cities. They then will also have the problem of overcrowding in the sense that um, the houses will be overcrowded. We will have a struggle with people um, finding a job. Um, sewage services will be under strain. Um, also, schools won't have enough place for the learners and then also the increase in pollution. Then what can we do to counter or then to prevent rural urban migration? So we can advertise the town, um, we can invest in tourism, um, and also recreation. So a lot of the rural towns now have different types of festivals where they've got music and food stalls where they want to almost boost the rural area. A lot of the, the uh, rural towns, they now have um, green energies and especially when we had load shedding, they said, come to our town, we are off the grid, no one will bother you here, and you also don't have to rely on ESCOM because we've got solar power or wind um, power. Then it's also, you can hike in nature, and then what they do is they restore old buildings and they advertise the town to say that this house was built in the 1800s and it's still in the same condition um, and then people want to go and look. Remember people, we are very curious and inquisitive. Another strategy is to have rural schools where they focus on um, giving people skills uh, to remain on the farms. Right, this is a question that they've asked your, I can't remember, I think 2022, 2021, roughly. Um, so this is an infographic. So let's have a look at the following, um, that you will have a text, you will have some statistics or sometimes a map, and then you will have an image. So the heading there is the population in rural areas. So they give you the definition of rural depopulation. Um, in the text, they also have a bus stop. They have a workshop. But have a look at what the sketch tells us, that the services have been cancelled. You have KR car sales, but the car sales is for sale. <laughs> and then also the shop in the village now has a closing down sale. So those are all the consequences of the dwindling population. So have a look in 2017, they almost had close to 19 and a half thousand people. And in the space of three years, almost 3000 people roughly left um, the rural areas. All right, so let's have a look at the following. You need to get an idea what the infographic as a whole is telling you. Then what are the different types of information given? I've referred to that. And then read the written information first and then look at the other information. Like I've mentioned, grade 12s, you have to read everything. Take a highlighter, take a pen, take a pencil and underline the most important things, the action words. What are they asking and what are they telling me in this infographic? And then very important, look for the links. So for example, over here they say the movement of people creates various economic and social challenges, reducing the standard of living so economic and social remember there's no shop 
In other words, they can't buy food, workshop, they are unemployed. If KR car sales close down, where are they going to, to work, especially the car salesman? And then also have a look at the dwindling numbers. So have a look at what they are telling you in the text and then uh, go and answer the questions. Right, so these were the questions that stemmed from this infographic. Define the concept rural depopulation. So very important. They tell you that it's rural depopulation is mainly caused by the migration of people from rural areas to urban areas. Now, grade 12s, that is not the answer. It's just a tip as to where we are going. Remember, depopulation decrease. So there's a drop in the number of people living in the area. Right. So it's the decrease in the population living in rural areas. It's not people moving from rural areas to urban areas. That is rural urban migration. Then they ask us to give evidence from the sketch, from the sketch that rural depopulation has occurred. So services have been cancelled. The car sales um, place is for sale. And then also the village shop is having a closing down sale. OK, so very important. Also, I can't see any people in this um, in this sketch. Now they tell us to refer to the table. Again, that's the instruction. So I can't give evidence from the, the extract or the text or the, the picture. I need to look at the table and give evidence that indicates that the rural depopulation took place between 2017 and 2020. So great wells, now you need to know the definition of rural depopulation. It is the decrease in population living in rural areas. They specify the year 2017 and they specify the year 2020. So the answer there, the population is decreasing because in 2017, they had 19,479 people and in 2020, only 16,408 people. Then they ask, what is the social importance of discouraging, in other words, limiting rural depopulation? So why do we need to discourage people leaving rural areas? So we need to have a cohesive rural community. We need to preserve family ties. So now you have to look at what are the push factors that will force people away from the rural areas. So keep these areas safe and secured. Uh, look at the well-being of people and also develop facilities and services. So grade 12s, especially now with your infographics, the answers are there. You just need to take your time and unpack this infograph and then have a look at what they ask you in the questions. Right, very, very, very important. I've mentioned the fact that you need to have a pen or a highlighter with you. So in a paragraph, immediately, full sentences and grade 12s, no bullets. No fancy frillies and flowers and arts and dots and knots and crosses. Full sentences of approximately eight lines. And immediately there you know I can't just write two sentences. Okay. Now you have to suggest. That's the action verb. So you have to give an explanation or solution. For four specific sustainable strategies not one not two four strategies that could do what that could create more employment opportunities in the 
rural areas. Okay, so what are they asking? They are asking us four things to create more work in rural areas. So they're looking for four things to give people on farms or in rural towns more jobs. So let's have a look at the following. There's a lot. So they want industries to move to the areas. They want tax relief. Oh, that would be great. Um, provision of basic services. So in other words, give them money to keep the shops open. Increase employment of local people. Allow farmers uh, loans so that they don't need to lay staff off. Um, encourage small-scale farming, and then also provide training to improve skills. So a lot of the time, people on the farms, they don't have the necessary skills. So if you can allow someone to learn how to drive a tractor and learn how to work with irrigation, the center point irrigation, or to know exactly when to put nitrogen into the soil, when do we plow, when do we do crop rotations. So you are upskilling the local uh, community. Right, <clears throat> let's have a look at land reform. Grade 12s, land reform is a bit of a sticky toffee in the sense that you need to know the definitions of all three of these terms. So land reform is where the injustices of apartheid um, are being addressed. So remember in apartheid, people were forcibly removed from their land. Now, very important, land restitution is to return land to its original owners. And then they compensate the people who have lost their land during the apartheid era. Land redistribution. So now the government buys the land and then makes it available to people who have been disadvantaged previously. Then land to new reform is they secure the rights of those living on land owned by others. And then land tenure reform, they are protected from eviction. Now, land reform also come with a lot of challenges. There has to be a willing buyer or seller. So, for example, if the government buys land and makes it available, the individual who owns that land currently needs to be willing to sell. Okay, even if certain farmers are willing to sell, they don't have a willing buyer. So, this whole process is expensive and it's tedious. It's a long process. A lot of the farming, um, in these areas are still subsistence farmers. There's also no economic growth. And then there are different disputes on claims where I come to the farmer and say that my ancestors lived here. This is my piece of paper to say that this land should belong to me. So now the farmer comes and he says, no, but his father and his father's father left you. And I'm talking absolute nonsense. So that also assists in the lengthy process of land reform. A lot of the time, if land is being returned to its original owners, a lot of them have no knowledge of farming and they are not well trained which then leads to agricultural decline. Um, let's uh, always use the example, if I know nothing about uh, farming with mealies, I might irrigate the farm for seven hours, where it's supposed to only be irrigated for one hour. So in the end, all my mealies will, will, will rot. Um, and the the soil will be too soggy. In other words, I can't even go in with my tractor because I've got no knowledge of farming. Right, very, very important. Just like with rural and urban areas, you have social justice 
issues. In other words, not a lot of them have access to um, a lot of, how can I say, help. Um, they don't have a lot of access to uh, people that will assist them and help them. So social justice issues, it's people that are being treated unfair. So let's have a look. Um, natural reasons, water, if they don't have rainfall, then they, the rivers will be non-perennial and then only a few lakes. So what's important now is with the fertile land, all of a sudden, if I don't have rainfall, then I won't have fertile land. The role of humans, especially in the rural settlements, um, a lot of the time, your dams will dry up. Um, the, the more people there are, the more pollution, <laughs> apologies, of the water. If I don't know how to farm, I might allow my cattle to overgraze and then um, in, increase the soil compaction. Now, this slide's a little bit weird. I'm going to move on to the next one. Right, so let's have a look to um, at the following. So there's land redistribution um, that can create jobs. Um, now, very important, grade 12s, I'm not going to focus on these questions as much um, because they, the questions appear in the quiz and I would like to still um, spend some time on the urban issues and also um, I really want to focus on the economic aspect of geography. Right, so let's go on to the urban settlements. Now, very important, these terms, oh goodness, grade 12s, very important. The level of urbanization is different to the rate of urbanization. So um, urbanization, we all know this ever since grade 10, it's the increase in the percentage of people living in urban areas. Urban growth is the increase in the number of people. Urban expansion is the growth in the physical size. And then the difference there between the level of urbanization and the rate of urbanization. The level of urbanization is the percentage of the total population that reside in urban settlements. The rate of urbanization is the percentage by which the urban population increases from year to year. So let's say in South Africa, the percentage of the total population living in urban settlements might be 60%. But the rate of urbanization, the percentage by which the urban population increases from year to year might be 10%. Okay, so that's very important that you note the difference between the level of urbanization and the rate of urbanization. Right, I really love this slide. So urban growth is the increase. So it's a repeat of the previous slide. And then just to um, indicate to you the example there, the level of urbanization might be 50%. So it's the size of the total population at a given time. And then the rate of urbanization is the speed or the increase. Then just quickly with regards to the word or the, the concept urban sprawl. Urban sprawl is rapid. It's unplanned, uncontrolled um, growth. So the city will then literally start bursting at its seams and then start spreading and um, increasing in size in an unplanned way. Counter urbanization. Very important, we've learned about rural urban migration. So counter urbanization is when people move from the urban areas to the rural areas. So towns such as Montague, 
um, ooh, one that's close by, even Marmesbury people are moving into that area, and then Grayton. So people decide to leave the hustle and the bustle of the city and then move to a more quieter town, but they are still in close proximity to the city. So yes, they are in the rural areas, but they are roughly an hour or so away from um, specialists and surgeons if they do need it. Right, so factors influencing the site and location of urban areas. Now, good old Cape Town has got its existence um, owed to the fact that we have fresh water, the fact that they have, we have Table Mountain, and <laughs> oh, sorry, and we also have big um, and major transport routes. We've got the harbour, and then also um, we all know that the Dutch settled here in 1652 because of the food supply, the fresh water, and we were a halfway stop um, for the boats um, on the trade route all the way along Africa. We were a little bit negatively impacted by the Suez Canal um, when they opened that at the north of Africa. All right, so physical factors, what is there? Natural freshwater, underlying rock, the relief, and then the social factor, what can we um, aid from and what can we get from um, as people? Right, so social, social media, it involves people. Right, let's have a look at the factors that influence the site and location of Cape Town. Now we know that there are no settlements on top of Table Mountain. It is too steep and it's also a protected area. The harbour over here promotes our trade. Um, no settlement at the ocean. And then the settlement on the slopes of Devil's Peak over there, as well as in the, the basin, the city centre over here, because of the level land. Right, let's have a look at how do we apply this to map work. So here we have an aerial photo of the town of Cirrus. So discuss two factors that affected the site as well as the location of Cirrus. And that is for six marks. So now we have to mention two factors. Um, that's strange that it's three times two. Uh, it should be two times two. Um, that re re uh, relates to why Cirrus was established in this area. So um, with map work, have a look at the RDAs, relief, drainage, infrastructure, settlements, and economic activities. So let's have a look at the slope. So over here, you have contour lines close together. And over here, you have level land. You can see the mountain over here. And then also on the aerial photo, the level land where the built up area is. Water, we can see they've got water. Um, roads, they've got the road going here, and they've got they've also got the railroad. Very important, they've got the Dwarfs River, so there's a access point um, to Sierras or access road uh, through or along the mountain. Then also have a look at the photo. So there you can see the river, the mountain, and then the level land with a built up area. Side factors, let's have a look at the following. Oopsie daisy. <clears throat> so remember our dry point, it's a marshland, so it's further away. There's a route, a road along the, the foothill, a gap. This is uh, let me just quickly go back to the town of Cirrus. So there's a gap in between the mountain, therefore they could settle um, there where Cirrus is, and then a wet point close to the 
water in a dry area. Right. Very important, the types of urban settlements according to their function. Now, lower order goods and services, they are needed often, like bread, milk, doctor. So they've got a smaller threshold population and several shops and services. So now we have a look at our central places. Now, our cities are normally central places for the surrounding towns. Central places, also an area or a place where we go if we need something. Higher order goods, we don't need them as often. So they've got a larger threshold population and then also less shops or services. So everyone needs bread and milk on a daily basis. But you don't necessarily need um, a garage to buy or a car sales uh, person to buy a new car every single month. Right. So car sales would be higher order. And then bread, milk, cool drink would be your lower order goods and services because we need them often. When we move to trade and transport towns or cities, normally where transport routes meet. So break of bulk transport from sea to land. So a Cape Town Harbour is an example of a break of bulk town because we've got the harbour, we've got our rail railroad, and then we also have the N1, the N2, and even the N7 um, leading out of town where we can distribute our goods. Junction, intersection of two main transport routes. So the R, um, in the Karoo, they've got the junction of various railroads as well as roads. And then a gap, a point of access at a physical barrier, a mountain pass. So we've seen an example of Cirrus. And then also on this slide, the example is Worcester. Then we have different specialized towns or cities. So the city was established because of a certain um, function. So let's have a look there. The city of Valcom was established due to mining, Stellenbosch, education, um, Secunda with all the um, industries of Sassel and various mines, industrial, um, Margate just close to Durban on our east coast, that's a resort, nice warm water, not the chilly water that we have along our west coast, along the east coast, they've got the warmer Zambia current, so the water's warmer there, so that's a resort town. And then commuter, Soweto, your southwestern township, um, just southwest of Joburg. So people historically had to live outside of the city and then commute into the city. Um, those of you that do history, um, the past laws of oh, I forgot the I forgot the date. I think it's 1986 or something. Um, so yeah, so that's the, the specialized towns or cities. Let's have a look at the following. So a central place town, they've got the hotel, they've got a bank, they've got the school, and then they've got the shops. And then these red dots over here, they all refer to our rural settlements. So if these settlements need the bank or the shops, then they need to move and, and drive into the central place town. Trade and transport towns, again, have a look at the key that they've provided us with, where the green is a settlement. They've got the, um, the roads there. They've got an, um, a river that you can navigate on. They've got the railway there. And then also they have the mountains. So very important over here, there's a railway coming into the settlement and then a road. So there's break of bulk over there, break of bulk. So from the sea to the railroad. 
You then have junction towns because there you have the intersection of two railways. You then have a gap town, three roads leading to the town uh, via the mountain pass. And then um, this one over here, you can also even have break of bulk there because we have a navigatable um, river. When we get to specialized cities, they have one dominant function. Now, again, look at this sketch that they are giving us. We have an iron ore mine, we have a university, a school or college, and then we have holiday towns. And then the gray shaded area would be our settlements. Okay, I'm not going to do that. The quiz can do that. Okay, let's we can continue. Just adjust it with some of the slides that are repeating. Um, I was yeah. Okay, let's go. All right, great twelve. Welcome back. So just a few with the um, aspects on the lower and higher order centers. So very important. Um, the we have more lower order centers. We have quite a few higher order centers. And then the position of the settlement is determined greatly by the number of functions and not necessarily the size of the population. Now, if we have a look at the highest order centers, there you have Johannesburg, Pretoria. Um, they are a lot bigger and they've got more functions than Cape Town, for example. Then if you have a look at a town such as Uppington, which is a country town, or then Bredastorp, which is a minor country town, um, there our functions decrease. Um, I still remember being in Bredastorp, someone had a heart attack and they had to be rushed to Somerset West, which is closer to Cape Town because of the functions. They don't have the specialized equipment, um, for example, in the hospital at Bredastorp. They can only, for example, stabilize a patient, but then the patient had to be transported to a hospital where they've got more specialists on call. And then also we have a lot of lower order services. That's basically any rural town. So Mikey's Fontaine still in the Western Cape and then Clarence all around the Free State. So there we have our lower um, centers. So again, if we have a look at our urban hierarchy, the functions determine the position of the settlement. <clears throat> right, great twelves. These are three um, concepts that you have to note. Um, you have to be able to define these concepts related to central places. Now, the sphere of influence, that's the area from which a business will draw the clients. So a car dealership will have a larger sphere of influence than a local cafe or even a spaza shop. So if you have a look at the amount of spaza shops in various neighborhoods, there's one on every corner, whereas you won't necessarily have a car dealership on every corner in a neighborhood. All right. Then our threshold population, the minimum number of people needed to support a business or service. So um, then Let's say, for example, I need about 30 people that can buy from me. But then again, um, in my shop, I need 30 people. Then if I'm a car dealership, I don't need 30 people to buy on a daily basis. I can basically just sell 10 cars in the month. So the threshold population will differ between a normal cafe or shop and then a car dealership. The range, the maximum distance that people or consumers are prepared to travel for goods and services. I, for example, won't drive very far just to buy bread and milk, but I do need to 
um, drive further, let's say, if I need um, a doctor. All right, so the range. I don't mind driving further to get to a doctor, so I'll drive 20 kilometers to get to a doctor, for example, but I'm definitely not going to drive 20 kilometers just for bread. So I will just go to the shop around the corner or a local cafe in the neighborhood because it's something that I need just quickly. All right, so this diagram over here is the sphere of influence, roughly a range of 10 kilometers. Now you also have the sphere of influence and a lot of the shops will overlap. <clears throat> Let's have a look at our urban structure and patterns. Now grade 12, this is very important, um, especially on map work. Here's a nice map of Paul and Paul situated in between um, the Paul Mountain as well as the De Toyskloof Mountain and then also situated along the Berg River. So the topography as well as the access to water influence the linear shape of Paul. When we have a look at map work and remember I've mentioned R dies, R, D for donkey, I, S and E. Our relief is our topography, our contour lines, the brown on a map. So there we have the mountains, the shapes. So this is Peter Maritzburg. Let's have a look at the following. So over there, you have the older um, area of Peter Maritzburg. So that's our rectangular shape. But then it has expanded into a stellar shape and the reason why I say it's the older area is have a look at the following um, let me just quickly get the laser pointer there we go so have a look at the font or the way that these words are printed on the map so there's um, a monument from 1840 there's um, a church, there's another church, there's an old government house, there's a museum, and then also another monument. So this is the historical area, so that is our rectangular shape. And then as the area expanded, it expanded into various directions, leading to a stellar shape. Now, grade 12 is very important. The different street patterns in urban areas. So the gridiron or the rectangular radial kind of looks like a spider web and then irregular looks like a teacher's brain at the end of the term. I'm sure the teachers can relate with me. So very important with our rectangular street pattern, the roads intersect at right angles. Now you can only imagine the advantages and the disadvantages. So advantages, easy to plan, we divide it into blocks, it's easy to find our way. However, if you've got intersections at every single corner, then you are going to have a lot of traffic congestion. It's monotonous, it's residential block on residential block on residential block, and then because of the various intersections, a lot of accidents may occur. Radial, it ra radiates outwards from a central point. There's an easier flow of traffic. All roads lead to a central point. But now what's interesting is the disadvantages. Again, you have a lot of traffic jams. Think about load shedding or if there's an accident and someone took out the robot, then that's going to have a knock-on effect with people wanting to proceed into the center of the town. So our traffic is slow and we've wasted a lot of space. With irregular, there's no clear stru uh, structure and very important, irregular can be planned irregular or unplanned irregular. 
So an irregular street pattern greatly improves the flow of traffic. There are fewer intersections and the irregular street pattern can also be constructed on areas where you have a hilly area and it accommodates the topography. It's very difficult to plan an irregular street pattern. It's very easy to get lost. It kind of looks like a maze. And then you can't necessarily expand or subdivide because of that unplanned um, irregular pattern. Certain newer developments, especially your security estates and estates on the outskirts of the city on the rural urban fringe, their roads follow the topography. So their um, street patterns can be planned irregular. The developers specifically develop the roads in that way in order to best suit their um, architectural plans. Right, let's have a look at the following um, street patterns. So again, we are in Peter Maritzburg. So there, the grid pattern, it's on gentler slopes and it's older. Irregular pattern can be on the steeper slopes. So remember here, it's older and you can see that by means of the um, different monuments. Then very important, the advantages and the disadvantages of the older pattern and then the irregular pattern. So you can see that this is the older area and then as people have ventured outwards in order to form that stellar shape, um, it's newer and then you can see that these roads are irregular. Okay, so I would consider these roads planned irregular. Right, the urban profile. So it's the view of an urban area from the site, normally from the CBD all the way out to the rural urban fringe. So the urban profile now takes note of the height of the buildings, the density, as well as the land value. And if we have a look in Cape Town, we've got the high rising buildings. They are quite dense and it's almost too expensive um, for a normal person off the street um, in order to buy a flat or even rent um, an office in those high-rising buildings. Right, so very important. Why does the height and the density of the buildings decrease as you move further away of the city centre? So the buildings become lower. In the CBD, that's where everyone wants to be. The transition zone, normally your zone of decay, leading to the residential and the industrial areas. So let's have a look. Right, so in the CBD, the buildings are high rises because I need a lot of people in that area, but I don't have a lot of space. So therefore, we build up. So a lot of competition and then offices and then a lot of commercial opportunities. When we get to the um, industrial zone, the land is cheaper, um, a lot of industries and then residential. So I've got level land, it's cheaper and I can um, establish a larger industry or even have a bigger house um, with my square area that that my house occupies as well as the industries because I've got um, lots of land and the land value is a lot cheaper than in the city centre. Right. When we get to our urban areas, Great Twelves, we have different land use zones. So you should be familiar with the concept CBD, our central business district. Uh, then we have our industrial zones with our heavy industries and our light industries. Remember, heavy, lots of noise, lots of pollution. Your light industries, mostly your textiles um, and industries that don't necessarily um, release a lot of pollution. Then we have our residential areas, 
Um, so remember that can be high income, low income, and it can also be an informal settlement. Then our commercial areas, there's a nice photo of Canal Walk. Then we have our zone of decay where people used to have buildings, but due to various aspects such as crime and businesses closing down, there's our zone of decay. And then you can see there's a lady playing golf with the rural urban French, mostly at, on the edges of cities, there where you have more space, you will find your golf courses and your cemeteries and, and also nowadays your golf estates and your security um, estates. Right, um, just re, um, how can I say, re-emphasizing the questions that geographers use. What is it? Where is it? Why is it there? What does it look like? What's the impact on the environment? And then how can we manage? So these land use zones, you need to know what they are. And then remember the impact. If we don't specify positive or negative, you have to indicate to us impact can be positive and negative, and then you state the various impacts. <clears throat> Let's quickly run through the different land use zones. So this is the um, land use zone of the central business district. So where is it in the center of the city? Because it's most accessible. It's where our transport routes meet. So those of you that have traveled to the waterfront, for example, you can see that as we travel along the N1 or the N2, we have high rising buildings and that's where the roads lead to. So it's the highest land values, tall buildings, density um, is quite high. And then that's where we have all our surgeons, our banks, um, and then also uh, certain hospitals. When we move to the in industrial areas, now you have your light and your heavy industries. Um, so very important, light industries, it's near the CBD, it's near residential areas, and there's little noise and air pollution and not a lot of heavy machinery. Whereas our heavy industries, they are on the outskirts because they need roll, road and rail networks. They need water and they need level or then flat land. A lot of the heavy industries emit a lot of air as well as noise pollution. They've got trucks with um, air brakes and a lot of the trucks go beep, beep, beep whenever they reverse. Um, so definitely heavy industries, a lot of noise pollution, a lot of air pollution because they also need to be close to their um, resources and the minerals. Right, so let's have a look at the factors that influence the location of industries. So again, here we have the town of Paul. <clears throat> so let's have a look. We can see that here we have the river and its level area. Therefore, you've got the industrial area situated right next to the railroad. You've got Paul um, Mountain or Paul Rock over here. You've got the, the transport. You've got the roads there, you've got the railway, you've got water in the river, you've got water in the dam, and then the residential areas will be our market, and then our labor close to the residential areas, and then also our raw materials, the orchards and the vineyards, and then they have to have a power supply. So there we can see the power lines. With our residential zone, very important, um, you have middle to high income and then also low income and then our informal settlements. So our middle to high income found away from the CBD, they, they more often have a better view of the area, they are large uh, properties, they've got good services and they also have recreational areas and parks. 
<clears throat> apologies, the lower income areas will be closer to the central business district because they want to be closer to their place of work. The houses will be close together. They, they, they might not have a hospital. They might just have a clinic, poor services, and then smaller properties. So your residential blocks, especially in map work, will be a little bit smaller. When we get to the informal settlement, mostly on the outskirts of the city, um, the houses are built of recycled material, material that is already there and people can go and they can easily also move um, their, their structure, right? So it's not a permanent structure. Unhealthy conditions, they more often don't have running water, no service delivery, there's no garbage truck like in the middle to high income areas. Every Tuesday, the garbage truck comes and it takes all the garbage and the black wheelie bins away. Um, then also the informal settlement is mostly characterized by poverty and crime. Some people say that the informal settlements are lawless. Um, in other words, there's no service delivery of policing. Um, and even in Cape Town, a lot of ambulances and police, they don't want to go into informal settlements because of the crime and because of their, their staff being attacked by residents in these areas. The informal settlement also has a lot of positive characteristics. Okay, so it's not all just doom and gloom and negative. A lot of the informal settlements, they create their own jobs, they, they um, create their own employment, they have their own services there. Um, and a lot of the time, people in the community, for example, have daily cleanups or weekly cleanups. Right, let's have a look at the following. How will you be able to identify a high, middle or a low income um, residential area on a map or on an ortho photo? So high income, it's level land, they've got a nice view, large residential blocks, lots of greenery, lots of trees, right? Then the middle income, you can see immediately over here, the residential blocks are smaller. They still have trees. The houses are a little bit smaller than the houses on this ortho photo. Then low income, you can see that, yes, they do still have services. There's a school over there. There's some recreational ground over there. But immediately the residential blocks are smaller. And you can also see there's a higher concentration of homes in this residential block. So immediately the density is also higher. And the houses are a lot smaller in size than the ones on these two photos prior. Right, informal settlements. So this is um, Mbombela by the looks of it. So a lot of the time you will have an area that is indicated as built up area on the map. And then if you have a look at the ortho photo, or, <laughs> sorry, or an aerial photo, you can see that there are no roads here. Um, you can see that it's corrugated sheeting, um, the houses and then the structures are very, very close to each other, which also then brings about the um, their own uh, challenges and problems. Okay, so there you can see um, the corrugated sheeting. There we go. As we move on to the land use zones, the commercial, there's the CBD. You can see Cape Town, oh, the Table Mountain in the background. And then also with a commercial zone, uh, I still remember telling my one class one year that I think canal walk started and I was almost out of high school and they looked at me like, woman, how old are you? Um, because growing up, the area where canal walk is now, it used to be a marsh and 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 a flay, a wetland area. Um, and then they ask me how old I am and then I, I always tell them between 100 and dead. So uh, very important. A lot of the commercial areas, 
are being decentralized. So our commercial zone, everyone knows what a mission it is to get into the city. So what they've done is they have moved shopping malls further away um, from the city center um, into areas where it's more accessible to various residents. Then the zone of decay or the transition zone. Um, over the past few years, the areas of Salt River, Mowbray, um, Observatory, that would be considered our zone of decay and our transition zone. However, lately, if you say that you have um, a flat in Ops or Observatory or Salt River, a lot of the old buildings that used to be um, industrial buildings, they have now been um, completely renovated and um, with quite a hefty price tag. Um, so it's you can clearly see the renewal of, of the area. So it's almost like a transition zone. It's the zone of decay. It's just outside the CBD. It's still valuable land because of its proximity to the CBD. But because of um, increasing prices, uh, people can't necessarily keep up with the maintenance of the building. And then more often the, the, the buildings are empty and then you have a lot of unwanted um, elements moving into the area. Um, crime, for example, illegal occupants in, in, in the buildings. And then that brings a whole different dimension of problems with it. Right, so I've spoken about um, the housing density. So what people do is they build larger flats there and then renovate and renew the area. Right, so this is the zone of decay. You can clearly see um, industries, mixed functions. There's an industrial park. Um, and then also you have some renewal. If you have a look at this building, quite old um, old buildings over here and then you have the CTM where you can clearly see that it's a more modern um, architectural uh, style also. So you have newer buildings and then you have your industries all in the zone of decay or then your transition zone. Right, with our urban settlements, you have a lot of issues. So very important urban settlement issues, we see them on a daily basis, congestion. So in Cape Town, we only have two roads leading into our CBD. So too many cars on the road, too many people using their own cars, not enough public transport. And then also it's a very old street pattern. So the city of Cape Town is rectangular in the street pattern. So we've learned that that is um, a recipe for a lot of traffic congestion. We have air pollution, we have more accidents, and then we have stress and health problems and road rage. Then the solutions, the city can improve their public transport, people should make use of lift schemes, decentralization of businesses like they've done in Montague Gardens, and then also the area in and around Canal Walk, and then also to synchronize traffic lights. So for example, don't have three robots red, but there's a major intersection that's got a, um, a green robot, but people can't get to it because of the previous um, two robots always being red. Then we get our urban decay, where part of the city is over used. So too many people living in the city and then also you have empty buildings. So what will they do? Um, and this links to the next one, overcrowding. If we have too many people that move into the city, they're going to struggle um, to get a house. There's a high demand for land and then they will move into the city. So the effects, slums will develop, services will decline because we cannot get to every single um, person on a daily basis. So then it will become polluted and the area will become dirty, uh, partly because of the lack 
of service delivery due to the strain on municipal services. So we need to improve our services. Um, we need to reduce our housing density and then start with renovation and renewal. With regards to overcrowding, because of the influx of people into the city, what's going to happen? Increase in pollution, increase in health problems, and now all of a sudden um, the, the movement and the influx into the, the city now becomes a disadvantage to the environment because we are producing too much waste. So how can we um, uh, prevent this? We can decentralize certain functions, we can create green belts, and we can enforce stricter control of pollution. In other words, only have factories working for a certain hour, then they have to stop um, to allow the pollution to be less or force industries to put um, certain filters on their chimneys. Um, and not a lot of industries and, and, and owners of factories will be open to this because it's an increase in cost and operational cost for them as owners. Right, urban settlement issues, informal settlements, very important. Those are the questions that geographers ask. So what is it? It's sometimes an illegal settlement of makeshift dwellings made from scrap materials, materials that people can find. It's on the edge of the city, um, partly because they cannot afford to be close um, to the CBD. The problems, the lack of infrastructure, <coughs> apologies, no proper sanitation, no clean water, electricity or refuse removal, lack of amenities and fire, and then also the high population density. So grade 12, just by looking at that photo, you can see that there are very few roads, ambulances, fire trucks, they can't enter the area. Um, if there's a fire, it's not like in a middle or low income residential area where the person can say um, there's a house, a light on um, Rose Street 13 in the Belleville area, for example, um, because of these informal settlements, they don't necessarily have um, house numbers and street names. So it's very difficult for emergency services to enter into the area. So then how can we manage the high population density? So then that's another stress on the cities. So very important, how can we manage them? We can, um, the, the density, we can provide them with houses, we can improve um, on the problem. So for example, better infrastructure, better sanitation, provide them with water, electricity, and municipal services uh, provide them with amenities such as recreational areas or clinic, um, have certain points, for example, where there are fire extinguishers or fire hydrants, and then also with the provision of houses, the population density will decrease. Now we move on to the informal sector. Now, the informal sector is people that are working um, in the sector because they are not employed in the formal sector. Apologies. So this would be our hawkers, our parking guards, casual laborers, and very important, they are not registered and they do not pay tax. <coughs> Sorry, let me just get a sip of water. Okay, let's see how it goes now. <coughs> so with the informal sector, we have different characteristics. So the workers are all self-employed. <coughs> Um, they are semi-skilled or then unskilled.
Right, my apologies. I just had to mute my mic for a cough attack. Um, very important. These people don't have a lot of capital investment. In other words, they don't have money to start their own businesses. There's also no job security in the sense that if they don't have products to sell, then they don't have an income. The importance of this informal sector is that it provides some sort of income to these areas. And then what's important to note is that for them, it decreases unemployment. <coughs> um, and then also there's a lower price of goods. <coughs> right then because of the just oh great so well, i'm terribly sorry so very important um for them to provide themselves with and income, um, it decreases unemployment. They can also provide um, lower prices for goods. And then because they have an in income, um, they can now, there's a decrease in crime in the area. Now, the reason why the informal sector is on the rise is due to the job losses in the informal sector. So a lot of the time people are moving into the area, um, which will now lead um, or it's a result of the mechanization on farms and the industry. Um, they can't find a job in the formal sector because they don't have the necessary qualifications. And then a lot of the time it's immigrants um, migrating from the rural areas to the city who cannot find employment. The challenges, a lot of the time, these informal sectors and the people trading in the informal sector are being harassed by authorities. They've got no access to proper trading facilities. So if you look and you think about Cape Town weather, a lot of these informal traders, they don't have a covered area to to trade from they are exposed to the weather they do not get bank loans and then if they can't trade then they don't have an income they don't have skills and education to enter the formal economy Then if we have a look at how can we improve their situations. So if we provide them specific areas for trading, for example, give them um, a container to, to trade from, um, provide them infrastructure so they've got a covered area um, to, to sell from, um, if it's a sheltered area, then they don't have to stand in the wind and the rain. If we can grant them access to, to bank loans and then also start to regulate that sector. It means that if they, for example, don't have a good month with regards to sales, they then banks do allow them a loan because business will then start picking up again. If we have partnerships between private and informal sector, then that would um, work so much better because now the informal sector um, people, they will now be able to cooperate and work with private sectors. Learnership programs, for example, allow them to, I always use the example as having a, a small McDonald's stall, for example, um, and then learn to, and teach people 
about the entrepreneurial um, possibilities and how you you have a look at your income and your expenses. Then if you provide them with storage facilities, remember a lot of the time, these informal traders, they are mostly just carting around donkey. Um, they are carting around all of their goods on trolleys. Um, they are an open target to crime. So if you can provide them with storage facilities, then they can start trading a lot safer. They can lock up their products at the end of the day, and then they aren't exposed um, when they are walking to their houses because, and they also don't have to fear for the loss of their um, products because it's uh, already in a stored facility. Right, uh, great. Twelves. I'm just quickly going to have a sip of water and some cough medicine. Just give me about two minutes. All right, back again. Okay, great 12s. We are going into the last little bit, the last um, 45 minutes or so, but I'm going to see if I can do it um, quickly and efficiently um, and then allow you to ask questions on the chat, uh, for example. Um, I'm just quickly checking the time. Yes, we're good to go. All right. So grade 12s, as I've mentioned before, uh, with regards to economic geography in South Africa, our prescribed content is so the Sildana Bay IDZ, um, and then we've got PWV, the Gauteng area, we've got um, cattle, and then we've got or bee farming, and then we've got coal. Now, very important, uh, is this thing freezing now? There we go. So you need to know the structure of the economy. Agriculture would then be our beef or cattle farming. Mining would be coal, um, secondary tertiary sectors, industrial development strategies, and then the informal sector. Right, structure of the economy. So I'm not going to waste your time on this. The primary, secondary, tertiary sector, as well as the quaternary sector. So the primary sector, that's your agriculture, mining, forestry, fishing. Secondary sector, manufacturing and construction, where your raw material is being processed and manufactured. Tertiary sector, the provision of services such as trade, transport, hospitals. And then your quaternary sector is your higher level of expertise and technology, where you have your scientists, research, as well as your um, technology, your, info, your IT, your computers, and all of that. <clears throat> right, with our agriculture, so we have a lot of factors favoring and hindering agriculture. Now, very important to note, our small-scale farmers. If you're a subsistence farmer, then I farm from the land for myself. However, small-scale farmers can also be commercial. So if you have a look at a certain farmer, and I always use the example of wine, and that farmer can export a small amount of wine. Um, or he can sell um, a small, the small amount of wine that he makes on the farm, um, then that farm, they refer to it as a niche market, a very small and um, excluded community. So then a small-scale farmer can be a commercial farmer. So the amount of production between a small-scale farmer and a large-scale farmer, so it's very low production, and then a large-scale farmer 
they've got a large amount of tons and um, a larger crop yield. Small scale farmers do still con contribute to the GDP. You cannot write that they don't contribute to the GDP because they do. Um, however, just a small contribution. When we get to our large scale farmers, um, agriculture contributes the most to our gross domestic product. Right. Factors favoring agriculture. So everyone wants um, a piece of meat or chicken. So there is a high demand for products. In South Africa, we've got lots of fertile soils as well as our temperatures help crops grow. Um, we have a large availability of labor. Uh, we've got irrigation schemes. We've got various ports for trade. If you think about just Cape Town, all the wine and the fruit from the Krabo area that um, is being exported uh, from our Cape Town Harbour and also our international airport. Then we also have various amounts of research that have been done um, on agriculture. The factors that hinder, in other words, the factors that negatively influence um, agriculture is the fact that South Africa is a water scarce country. We have a low rainfall in most areas, soil erosion, natural disasters such as droughts, um, subsistence farming. A lot of the people, they farm for themselves. Um, they, are, they don't want to um, move over to commercial farming. Then also, if there's a pest, such as bird flu or swine flu, um, then a lot of the European countries, they will impose a ban, and then we cannot export our meat. Factors hindering also includes crime, such as livestock theft and farm murders, for example. Um, if you lose your livestock and you lose the person who owns the land, um, his son or daughter might not want to go out to the farm again, um, and then that farm will become almost like a ghost town. HIV and AIDS, and also just decreased immunity. If you are sick, you cannot work. Um, and then if you are sick and you can't work, then that farmer can't uh, um, get the crops off the field um, or the... the um, The fruit uh, from the orchards um, and then also the, the crop yield uh, might stay on the on the vine too long and then he might end up losing a lot of his produce. Then also because of the dry um, areas and the low rainfall as well as our bergwin conditions so we also are at risk of felt fires. <coughs> Right, so very important grade 12s if you have a look at agriculture. So very important, the contribution to the gross domestic product. Um, agriculture produces food, it develops our infrastructure, it provides a lot of people with work, it supplies raw material to industries. If you have a look at canned fruits and um, juices and even jams. And then also with our exports of uh, uh, beef, uh, specifically beef farming, um, and then also our ostrich meat, for example, then um, we do earn foreign exchange. In other words, we sell our products and then we get paid in dollars or euros or pounds. Our main agricultural products over there, the one that we focus on this year is beef. Right, food security, very important. Food security can be asked by means of infographics, by means of um, statistics or case studies. So very important when food security, I need you to read very carefully whether the question paper asks for food security or food insecurity. Right, so food security means that every single individual in the country has access to nutritious food and enough food to sustain a healthy lifestyle. If we don't have food um, security, we have food insecurity. When all the people do not have access 
um, to enough food to sustain a healthy lifestyle. In other words, we don't have um, access to nutritious food. Now, the factors hindering food security is if we don't have fertile land, uh, we have drought, we have poverty. In other words, you cannot afford food. Increase in food um, prices, climate change. Uh, we all know about climate change. If the world is getting hotter, we might struggle to produce certain crops. Um, wastage of food, land reform. So, for example, if someone's being given um, a farm, but they don't have the knowledge, um, and then that farm will then ultimately lead to um, the erosion of soil and um, infertile soil. Population growth. We don't have enough food to supply to the um, rapidly um, expanding uh, population. South Africa's population recently went over 63 million. Um, so we do have a lack of um, food security because we are becoming too much. Um, our population is growing exponentially. And then also a large amount of subsistence farming. With subsistence farming, they farm for themselves. In other words, they cannot contribute to their, their, their crops to a shop um, to aid in giving food to the rest of the country. With the different measures, if we have sustainable agriculture, it means that we um, don't exploit the soil. We prevent soil erosion. We have efficient ways of storing food so that we don't waste food. We also don't waste water. Um, we regulate food prices in the sense that, let's say, for example, the fuel price increases, that um, food prices remain the same. <clears throat> We can also support small scale farmers and then good farming techniques. For example, if you see that someone's plowing down the slope um, where they are supposed to follow the contour lines, for example, you tell them, hang on, um, baby, you can't farm this way. Let me show you. Um, drought management, keep an eye out on the weather pattern so that you know um, I've now had four um, drier winter months. So I need to um, try and have a look at uh, maybe drilling a ball um, or investing in some jojo tanks in order to still have water for my cattle. And then also urban food gardens. Um, a lot of people, especially now in the cities um, and in certain communities, they've got a local community garden where they farm with their own fruit and vegetables, and the community um, helps upkeep the, the garden. And then they can also eat um, some of the carrots or spinach or broccoli um, and some lettuce, for example, that they farm in the area. So they, they then reduce the food insecurity. Right, so this is one of your prescribed um, content. It's um, cattle or then beef farming. So very important. What is beef farming? We farm with cattle in order to sell it as meat to the consumer. Then very important, our cattle farming or beef farming uh, contributes a lot to the economy of South Africa. Now, <laughs> even though... We don't have a large percentage of cattle farming in the Western Cape. We do have farmers farming with cattle. So very important. Um, cattle farming produces food. And then also the farmers farming with cattle, they contribute to tax. Um, with cattle farming, uh, they also allow South Africa to develop the infrastructure um, because we expand our electricity network, our road network, as well as the um, communication network. And then close to 2,1 million people are employed um, in agricultural sectors, um, more specifically cattle farming. So very important, the beef products um, supplies raw material to industries. So if we look at cattle, uh, we have butcheries, hide and leather, um, sometimes um, the, the skin um, and the leather. So then that also um, contributes 
to the different indus industries. So basically everything is being used. Let's have a look at the factors that favor beef farming. Now, grade 12s, if you have a look at what allows South Africa to be such um, a strong force globally in, in the export of meat. So we've got a lot of agricultural land. If you have a look at the Eastern Cape KZN, the Free State, um, and even the Gauteng and Mpumalanga area, 19%, 17%, 21%. So we've got a high demand for beef, beef products. Um, not everyone can afford um, the beef products, but there's still a high demand. We've got excellent research facilities to ensure that the cattle farmed is adapted to local weather and environmental conditions. We've got a large supply of labor. And then if you have a look at um, the areas where we have a higher percentage of beef farming, such as the Free State, um, Mapumalanga, as well as Gauteng and KZN, they are in close proximity to our ports, our Oatambo and King Shaka International Airport, as well as Durban Harbour. And even in the Western Cape, we've got our um, Cape Town International Airport, as well as the Harbour. Then we also have a nice developed or highly developed transport um, infrastructure that allows the transporting of meat. Um, we've got access to refrigerator trucks that can transport the meat. <clears throat> Then the negative, the, the factors that hinder beef farming, um, because of the influx of people into cities, farming sometimes have to make way um, for human settlements and other activities. So now we have a decrease in the availability of land. Um, our unreliable rainfall and then drought, and then also the occurrence of diseases, foot and mouth disease and ticks. Then also because of the high um, value of beef uh, uh, farming, a lot of people overgraze their soil, leading to soil erosion. A lot of the, the um, livestock is being stolen. Um, and then also something that we can't control is our natural disasters, droughts, floods, and then our Fault fires. Now, grade twelves. Um, I know Mrs. Prinsler sent this um, mind map to all the schools, so your teachers should be in possession of this. Um, and remember, if you study the beef farming, remember those questions: What is it? Where is it? Um, what's the impact of it? Um, so I want you guys to really study um, the following. Uh, mind maps really, really well. It's the bare minimum that you need to know on beef farming. If we move on to mining, so the mining um, prescribed topic is coal. So uh, it contributes um, to the gross domestic profit. It does provide jobs. It allows our harbors to be expanded. And then we also um, generate foreign exchange. And then also due to mining towns and infrastructure is being developed. And also due to mining, certain towns um, own their existence to mining. So the discovery of diamonds and gold, diamonds in Kimberley, gold in the Johannesburg area, developed infrastructure for South Africa. And then mining led to the opening of universities and educational institutions. We have a variety of minerals. You can see that for platinum, manganese and chrome, we are rated number one um, in the world. And then diamonds, number two, um, coal, seven, gold, five and iron or six in the world. So. Um, with our mining, a lot of investment happened into South Africa. And then the significance of mining is that mining attracted immigrants, which brought with them various um, knowledge and um, skills that they could, could share with the people in South Africa um, as to how to mine certain minerals and also what to do um, if if you 
um, if they stumble upon um, minerals. So um, the immigrants that are being attracted um, because of mining, um, immigrants are mostly seen as being a negative, but they do bring in skills um, and they share those skills with South African workers. Very important, we have factors that favor mining as well as factors that um, hinder mining. Now, very important, we have a large range of minerals. We also have a large um, amount of mineral reserves. We do have a lot of unskilled labor, partly because South Africa struggles with a very high unemployment rate. So we can benefit from foreign skilled miners. So that's the link to the immigrants. Um, and then countries invested money in our mines. That resulted in a well-developed infrastructure. Then the low production cost as minerals are close to the surface. It means that you don't have to dig as deep um, and incur costs because a lot of our minerals are very close to the surface. Our minerals being close to the surface, it also has a high quality. So the better the quality, the higher the income generated from these minerals. Then also we have a large coal resource that we can use to make electricity. Now the factors that hinder mining is the fact that we can't go too deep because of our high underground temperatures. It's costly to trade miners because it's a um, it's a very uh, detailed and intricate um, job. You can't just send anyone um, down a mine shaft and tell them uh, go mine uh, diamond or gold. Then also mine worker strikes. So a lot of the mine workers, if they are unhappy, then they strike, decreasing the efficiency and the productivity in these mines. Um, the areas where our mines are, and where our harbors are, remember mining, it's a uh, heavy um, raw material, so we need large trucks. Um, so we've got large distances to travel between mines and harbors before we can even start to export them. Water shortages, remember all those um, heavy machinery, they need cooling. Um, mining is dangerous. Then also fluctuating prices of minerals. If we export, we have to accept the price that um, our buyers are offering. Labor unrest and protests that link with the mine worker strikes. Then the large amounts of water being used, and also we are a water scarce country. Our minerals, even though we have a large minerals reserve, they are non renewable resources. So if we run out of coal, we run out of gold, what are we going to do? And then also a lot of factors, another factor, apologies, that hinder mining is the occurrence of accidents in mines. Now, a lot of the time in the news, we read about illegal miners um, that um, unfortunately passed in a mining accident because they entered into abandoned mines trying to dig for gold, especially in the Johannesburg area. And then some of the mines caved in or the tunnels caved in on them. So accidents in mines, that's one of the big issues um, hindering mining. OK, so again, our uh, mining product is coal. So I'm not going to go over the factors that hinder and the factors that favor because I've just done it on the previous slide. So very important, what is coal? Um, you need to know what that is. And then also we can ask you a paragraph on the environmental injustice of coal mining. So an injustice is when someone or something is being treated unfair. So for example, if you look at environmental injustice, if people are taking minerals from the soil, what's going to happen? They're going to scar the land. There's going to be soil erosion, acid mine drainage. Um, pollution of water sources, just to mention a few of environmental injustices. When we get to the secondary sector, various industries, so also different factories that influence the development in South Africa. So then we've got different industrial regions, such as Gauteng or the PWV, Durban Pinetown, 
Port Elizabeth, Utenaig, or then also referred to as Kucha, and then Southwestern Cape. So well, there are different factors that influence um, these areas and their location. <clears throat> Just quickly to recap the different types of industries. So food, um, clothes, factories, the textile industry, they are light industries. They don't have a lot of um, pollution. Then our heavy industries, you can see on the photo um, with the pollution going up there, the smoke coming from the chimneys. So the location might be close to the CBD in the zone of decay. And then our heavy industries are on the outskirts of the city, near the material source or near the, the raw material. Then the raw material on uh, with regards to a light industry, it's quite small, it's partially processed. However, with a heavy industry, it's large and bulky um, and, and it still needs to be processed. With regards to light industries and their land requirements, light industries don't have specific needs. Heavy industries do have a lot of needs. They need a lot of water, they need a lot of infrastructure, and they also need a lot of flat land. Then they need roads, railways, water and power supply. And then our light industries don't necessarily have a large impact on the environment. However, a heavy industry will have air and noise pollution. And if some of those industries have to work 24-7, they even have light pollution due to the spotlights in and around the, um, the plant where the heavy industry takes place. Right, this is very important, grade 12. Let me just quickly go through this whole um, slide. I'm sure Mrs. Prinsler will avail these slides to the teachers. So with the different types of industries, you have raw material orientated industries. And the answer there is in the name. It's close to the raw material. So iron and steel and sugar mills, such as your sugar cane, for example, um, they have to be close to um, the raw materials. Market orientated industries, they are close to the markets because the product is perishable, such as fresh produce or baked goods. So, for example, if you have a look at the area of Philippi, they are close to, to the market um, because the products there, the food, the, the fruit and the vegetables are perishable. When we get to footloose industry, so they can be located either near the market or raw material. So they are helped by technology. Um, they don't necessarily need a raw material to be close by. So research, design and software companies. Then um, your ubiquitous industries, they can be located anywhere. Um, such as a cell phone shop or a shop where you can buy anytime. They don't need um, a specific market or a specific um, a raw material. So provides a service 24 hours, seven days a week, such as our internet services and our telecommunication. A bridge industry located between the raw material and the market. It's kind of like a break of bulk industry. So an oil refinery. So it's in between um, the material, the raw material and the market and the um, consumer that can then get it from, let's say, the petrol station. All right. So it's the raw material that first needs to be refined and then it can be sold. Right. Very important, just like with settlements, certain um, industries need uh, certain factors and those factors will affect uh, as to where uh, these industries are being developed. So they need electricity, they need their resources, they need people uh, working there, they need level land, they need transport, they need communication, they need water and they need a place to sell it. And then also, um, the last one there on the right, policies. Basically, I can't develop an industry next to a marsh or a wetland if there's an endangered species of frog um, in, in that area. So then certain policies will restrict 
as to where I can locate my industry. Also, certain policies with regards to the um, emission of uh, um, pollution in certain areas, they don't want industries there um, due to the pollution and the health and safety of the residents. Then grade 12s, we have the Southwestern Cape and um, PWV that you have to know uh, for this year. However, you do need to know the Port Elizabeth Utenaic, um location as well as Durban Pine Town. Um, so you just have to know their location. There won't be any questions asked on um, Port Elizabeth Utenaic or Durban Pine Town. Right, the ones that you need to know is the PWV and then as well as the Southwestern Cape. Right, so the factors of the location, Southwestern Cape, historically, that's where, where um, we basically started with Cape Town. It's close to raw material. We've got adequate labor. We've got access to the shipping port, transport network, and also we have Kuburg Power Station, nuclear power. Um, readily available. So our main industries, wine, fruit, dried fruit, canned fruit, fish, as well as clothing. If we move further north to PWV or Gauteng, so there's a large market. Remember Gauteng is the smallest province um, by square kilometers or area, but it's also the province where the most people live. Therefore, they've got the larger market. They've got network of roads and railway lines. They've got labor. They've got different raw materials. They have enough water and they've got cheap electricity. Main industries there, chemical industries, iron and steel, motor vehicle factories, as well as machinery. <clears throat> right, when we get to the tertiary sector, grade 12, very important, the definition of tertiary activities, the examples, the role of trade, the role of transport, you need to be able to interpret graphs and tables as well as read through case studies. International trade, let's have a look at international trade. So it's the exchange of goods and services between countries. So that's the tertiary sector. Imports and exports, very important. The moment you bring things into the country, you are importing. And if you are shipping goods out, you are selling your product products or your produce to another country. It is exported to that country. Very important with international trade. Um, advantage, if we've got a surplus of goods, in other words, we've got too much um, we can dispose of some of our surplus um, through international trade. So we are using our natural resources. When we sell our goods, we get foreign currency. Then there's a larger variety of goods available. We have access to better quality of goods. We can create ties between countries. And then also we can gain more knowledge. With international trade, our transport and communication will be developed. There will be an increase in employment as well as an increase in salaries due to the access of uh, foreign uh, currency. And then also it will create some competition both internationally and locally. Okay, so then the disadvantages is a lot of um, developing countries depend on developed countries um, to, to import their goods that they don't have, which now means that the local production suffers. Um, our local industries are overshadowed by larger companies where they are, where a certain country is importing a lot. Richer countries may influence political matters in other countries. So, for example, if you don't trade with us, then we will. So then they play the monopoly card there. And then rivalries amongst nations. 
and also, uh, for example, Russia, Ukraine, the war, everyone's quite familiar with that. Certain countries might not want to, to work with Russia or Ukraine based on um, their rivalry. So I don't want to be, <laughs> apologies, I don't want to be involved in uh, Russia, Ukraine war. So I'm withdrawing my trade with um, those countries. Right, very important. Uh, South Africa's reason for development, one of the reasons, is the fact that we've got such a well-established transport network. So we have access to different locations. We have access to markets. We have access to domestic and international trade. And then because of our transport, less developed areas in the country can be developed. We can take goods and services into those areas. Um, if we can get uh, products to certain areas, then that will reduce the cost of economic sectors in order for them to, to import um, those products, for example. And then with uh, established transport, we have an improved business efficiency. In other words, we can get things done quicker. Right, great Twelves, we are nearing the end. So with regards to our strategies for industrial development, this is very important and it's, it's a topic that's most often um, not even studied. Right, so very important. Um, with regards to our industrial development strategies, we have the Good Hope Plan. We then also have the Reconstruction and Development Program, or RDP. We then have Growth, Employment and Redistribution, also um, shortened as GEAR, that's the acronym there. Then we have Industrial Development Zones and Spatial Development Initiatives. Now, very important, you need to know the Saldana IDZ as well as the West Coast SDI. That is part of your prescribed content. So an IDZ is an industrial estate linked to an international sea or airport. Now the one that we need to study this year is the Saldana Bay IDZ. Um, and then it's always good to know about the others. Um, so then our special economic zones. So an IDZ is also now known as a special economic zone. Right, so you need to know where they are. <clears throat> so very important um, with our IDZs, we are focusing on export-led development. Right, then we have our SDI, our Spatial Development Initiative. So the Saldana Bay IDZ falls in the West Coast Investment Initiative. So on the slide, it says that the Maputo Development Corridor will be examined. Please ignore that. It is wrong. Um, we do not do Maputo Development this year. Right, the one that you do need to know, and this is most likely the best summary of the West Coast SDI for me. Um, and all the teachers do have access to this um, summary. Now, the definition of a, a, a SDI, it's an initiative or plan to promote the growth in underdeveloped or poor areas that have the potential to grow. So it's agriculture, fishing, aquaculture, tourism, manufacturing, and mining. Those are the economic activities that we are looking at. The location of Sildana is from Atlantis. It's about 40 kilometers north of Cape Town to about five kilometers northeast of Fred and Dal. Now, the reason why we are developing the Sildana area is it's well located because it's a naturally deep harbor. We've got space, so we've got cargo facilities to handle exports and imports. We can export iron ore 
Um, you should be familiar with the Session Soldana railway train, um, how they get the iron or all the way from the, the, the mines in Session to the harbour and the production manufacturing um, area in Soldana. So then also we can handle offshore extraction of oil and gas because of that deep port. So very important, where are they focusing and what are their developmental areas? So we have the Friedenburg-Soldana Regional Development Corridor. We've got access to the N7 as well as the Northern Rural Development Corridor. Now advantages for the local communities, grade 12s, I know you are tired and we are almost finished, but when we get to the Soldana Bay question, everyone thinks that, oh, it's Soldana, it's just around the corner. It's just like with the settlement question. People think they know the area, they will do well. Oh, I don't even have to study this, I know Soldana. You cannot be more wrong. So if we ask questions on Soldana, are we asking for the Western Cape, are we asking South Africa, or are we asking uh, the impact and the advantages for the local community? So the West Coast um, Spatial Development Initiative allows for employment opportunities, all right? We can earn money and then also therefore reduce poverty. With that, we can better the services we can then give people a higher standard of living. We can allow entrepreneurs in the informal and formal sectors, and then the STI will increase the productivity and wealth of people. So with a local community, I always explain it um, like this. If I've got access to the Spatial Development Initiative, and I know that people are going to start developing in that area. Now, it's an area that they won't have a shop or a cafe close by. So if I've got the means of going there with my car and selling um, chips or our, our bright chicken next to the area where they are building, it's a means of income for me, an employment opportunity that I would not have had. Even if I did not have a job, I might not be skilled or even semi-skilled, and they can employ a lot of semi-skilled um, or even unskilled laborers with the um, development and the construction of the West Coast SDR. With um, South Africa's economy, we've got improved links now. Um, we are developing new and existing infrastructure. We've got access to different markets. We've got access to our local markets and we've got access to international market. We've got the different trade routes. Um, I've already mentioned the transport. We've got international links, um, employment, as well as um, in the Soldat or the West Coast area, they've got sustainable water um, for domestic and industrial use and farming. So those are the advantages for South Africa's economy. Um, very important to note the difference between the advantages for the local community and the advantage for South Africa's economy. Right, this is an excellent, excellent, excellent summary um, on the Soldana Bay Industrial Development Zone. So what is an industrial development zone. So they are purposely built industrial estates um, in order to support export. All right, so they are close to areas where um, we've got access to transport routes and international links. So you need to know where the Sildana Bay IDZ is. Very important, it's got the deepest harbour as well as its proximity to Cape Town. So it's got the harbour and it's got the access to Cape Town International Harbour. The factors favouring, we've already done some of them, such as the deep port, um, they've got oil and gas, there's labour, there's sufficient flat land available, they've got energy and they've got a good transport link. The economic impacts, is um, economic development, 
you have industries located closer to the resources as well as the um, raw materials. Um, the economic impact, people can move around, they uh, have access to job, um, they can also skill and reskill people. So, for example, if I'm unskilled, but the Sultana Bay IDZ, one of the companies, employ me, they teach me how to operate a forklift, then I can carry that skill with me and then ultimately get a better, a better paying job, apologies, um, once the IDZ is completed. Then the social impact, there's a greater income for local communities, more people into the area, more money is generated, and then a better standard of living. One of the factors that hinder this development is the lack of technical skills um, in our areas. Um, the aims and the goals of Saldana, so we want to promote growth we want to increase the levels of uh, foreign investment. We want to promote international competitiveness and we want people to manufacture in the area and use the local um, products instead of importing them. So um, grade 12 is very important. They can ask the Saldana Bay IDZ as well as West Coast, as well as BWV um, in theory or in map work. If we get to the informal sector, now the informal sector is character, so it's the concept, you have different characteristics, why do we have such a high informal sector employment, what are the challenges, um, and then what's the role, how can we strengthen the informal sector, and then they can ask the informal sector by means of case studies. So if you have a look at what we've done previously with the informal sector, um, here you can see that these ladies are out in the sun, they don't have any shelter, and anyone can just run past, grab a few potatoes, and they will have a loss of income. So ways that we can better that, that um, and better their experience also is to give them um, specify trading areas, um, put up some infrastructure for them, allow them storage facilities, because women are also often seen as a target um, and, and an easy target um, for criminal activities. Right, so the this is a repeat. Right, um, so grade 12s, we've reached the end.